Hey everybody, thanks for joining me here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I'm very happy to welcome back our friend Rick Salmon. Hey Rick. Hey, how you doing? I'm glad you said I'm your friend. <laughs> of course. Uh, Rick is here today to present travel photography tips as well as some of his favorite Topaz tips. So I'm excited to see what he has to share with us today. Rick is an award-winning professional photographer and a very well-known authority on post-processing techniques. His images from his travels to more than 100 countries have been published in numerous newspapers and magazines and have been featured on in his 36 books, including the popular Rick Salmon's Exploring the Light, which is awesome if you haven't read it. Um, also, 11 apps, including Rick Salmon's 24-7 Photo Buffet. In recognition of his talent and influence, Rick has been named a Canon Explorer of Light. He's also a Westcott Top Pro Elite, recognized for his skill in portraiture and lighting. Rick is also an instructor on Kelby One Training, where he shares his knowledge about light and composition, and we are very excited to have him back with us today. So with that, let me go ahead, and I will give you the screen, Rick. Thanks so much for uh, joining me. It's great to be back, Nicole. I think this is like my uh, fourth time here. <clears throat> you know, I've been using... It's actually okay. your sixth. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, time flies when you're having fun. Well, it's my sixth time, but I think I, I've been using Topaz since day one when you guys introduced uh, Adjust, Topaz Adjust. And the, do you say Spicify or Spicify? I say Spicify, but I've been told I'm wrong and it's Spicify, so it's, <laughs> been, it's both ways. <laughs> well, well, anyway, it, I, I really do love you guys. You guys have, have like a great product. Now, <clears throat> everyone who comes on my workshops, everyone who comes to my live seminars, and everyone who comes to my online seminars is a student for life. Now, out of, out of 1,400 people who have signed up for this uh, webinar, actually, <clears throat> there's probably no one, actually, I know there's no one there who sent me an email that I did not answer because I answer actually every email. I can't answer everything on Facebook and Twitter and Google+, but I do answer all the emails. So if you guys have a question after this, you can contact me at Rick Salmon uh, through my website. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to be showing some of my latest uh, travel pictures, including this shot. Uh, actually, this I call it an image because I processed it in the Topaz uh, Restyle, which you see down on the bottom there. On, uh, I took this on Route 66. As Nicole mentioned, I've been to like 100 countries. Well, I might have been to 100 countries, but one of my favorite trips was along Route 66. So I'm going to be giving a little some travel tips. I have a, well, I have a slideshow right now that I'm going through. So I'm going to be giving travel tips, and then we're going to get into the, uh, the processing. One quick tip here. When I see a scene like this, I want it to look you know, in my camera, in that image, as it looks to my eyes basically everything in the scene in focus. You can see the twigs in the foreground and the grass is in focus. The telephone poles and the, and the wires in the back are in focus. So that's what I, I try to do in, mostly when I see a scene like this. And to do that, it's a wide-angle lens. My favorite lens, I think probably 95% of my pictures on Route 66 were taken with the Canon 17 to 40 millimeter lens set at around 17 millimeters. So it's a wide angle lens, small aperture, f16, and you focus one third into the scene. Meaning that uh, just because you have an autofocus camera, my friends, it doesn't mean that your camera knows where to focus. Now this image did not start out like this. This looks, pr I think, kind of cool. The great sky, the great colors, because I use restyle. So I'm going to be getting into the demos after this. Uh, I'm sure all you know uh, Scott Kelby, my friend Scott Kelby. For more on travel photography, you can just go on YouTube and uh, check out episode 128. It's about an hour show on travel photography. So recently I've been to Myanmar. If you go to my website, just ricksalmon.com, over on the left you click on photographic or photography galleries. Out of all the places I've been, again, Route 66 was cool, but i got to tell you, <laughs> Myanmar was, it used to be called Burma was very cool too. So when you go to a location, if you look at these pictures, you know, I have the landscapes, I have the people, you know, I have the scenic shots, I have inside shots, I have portraits, I have, you know, environmental shots. The the idea is to tell the whole story. And wherever you go, like I was out west earlier, actually uh, uh, late late last year, out west at the national parks and the state parks, and I tried to tell the story there. You see, I have close-ups, I have wide-angle shots, I have fisheye shots. So telling the story is really important. I lead workshops to Iceland. <laughs> Iceland is amazingly beautiful. But here again, what am I doing? I'm trying to tell the story. 
So if you want to check out some of more of my some more of my pictures, just go on my photographic galleries, especially the Route 66 gallery. I'm really proud of those images. Wherever you go, if you want to find the right light, I actually have an app. It's only $2.99. It's called Rick Sammons Photo Sundial. I know we have listeners from around the world. This uh, app actually tells you where the sun's going to be any time of the day around the world. Also has a has a, a weather a weather a weather feature in there and shows you where the moon is. So <clears throat> a couple of more shots before we get into before we get into the actual processing of this. This is one of my favorite places on Route 66. Uh, a place called Tutankari, New Mexico. It's an HDR shot. Now think about this when it comes to HDR. By opening up the shadows and toning down the highlights, you're basically reducing contrast. So that's where Topaz Clarity comes in. Clarity is an amazing, amazing plug, and that helps you, that's right, bring back some clarity to the image. Now here, are, by the way, here are the six shots that I used to create uh, that uh, image. One of my favorites from Route 66. And when it comes to travel photography, it's all about the light. What makes this picture kind of cool? It's the light. Notice, by the way, everything in the scene is in focus here. I took this picture maybe three minutes before I started taking the HDR pictures for this sequence. Pretty boring shot. What's the main difference? The light. Here the sun is at my back, and here I'm shooting into the sun. By the way, you get that starburst at f22. And if you want to get a really cool starburst, shoot when the sun's low in the sky and have it just peeking around, just peeking around from an object. Otherwise, it might look like a big blob in your picture. You know, <clears throat> as a travel photographer, you know, I, I used to have an expression. There's no such thing as a bad day. as a bad day for pictures like bad weather. Well, <laughs> here's what happens when I was at the Wigwam Motel on an overcast day, and here's what it uh, looked like. Uh, on, a, on a sunny day. So light really does play an important factor. Yes, we can do so much uh, with plugins, but we want to get in Photoshop and Lightroom, and we, but we want to get the best in camera shot. Quick tip here, use your camera like a spaceship. I see so many travel pictures where the photographer is just standing up and shooting you know, straight ahead. Here you can see I got down on the ground, uh, and I'm shooting so you feel like you're like at, at the level of those door handles there. Also when you're shooting, use what's called border patrol. Run your eyes around the frame. Make sure important elements aren't cut out like that heart you see over on the right. And you see uh, someone wrote their name over there on the right too. Everything in the scene is in focus by the way as you, as you see there. So anyway, <clears throat> another, uh, another thing I was trying to do there, this is kind of fun. I wanted to do a project called See Through It, Shoe Through It. So here you see you see uh, one of the wigwams. Actually, it's a teepee, even though it's called a wigwam motel, <laughs> uh, through the window. Here you see that car perfectly framed there. So this would be a fun assignment. You could do this you know, in your driveway or in your neighborhood. Do a thing. See through it, shoot through it. Try to get everything in the scene in focus. Use that foreground element to add a sense of depth to the picture. Another shot, this is from uh, Williams in, uh, along the Route 66. Actually, there is no more Route 66. The superhighway destroyed it, killed all the towns, but there are historic parts of Route 66. So when you drive along the superhighway, you'll see little signs, historic Route 66. So check this out. Topaz Denoids, I'm going to be giving you a demo on another picture. Uh, in the in the presentation part of this, which uh, I know Nicole <laughs> really wants me to get to, but we did promise half travel uh, or some travel and some topaz tips. Here's the thing: topaz to noise is the best way I found to reduce noise grain in the picture. Here's the original shot. Look how I was just walking along, and the train was coming by, and I just raised my lens and I shot. Most noise shows up in the blue channel, and no, most noise shows up in underexposed areas. This train is probably about three or four stops underexposed. Well, with a little Photoshop uh, magic and stuff like that, I was able to create this image, right, nice sunny black and white image, and I was able to reduce the noise with Topaz the Noise. If you're, yes, we could take out the noise in Lightroom and Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw, but what this does, what I really like doing, and I'll show you, is that you can control the noise in the shadow and highlights areas uh, independently. So anyway, that'll be fun. Also, noise can show up in the sky. 
especially in underexposed skies. So here's a, the first picture I actually took on Route 66. I used topaz and noise to reduce the noise uh, in the sky. Long Route 66 met some wonderful, wonderful people. If you saw the movie, the Disney movie Cars, if you saw the, uh, the added segments at the end, this man is actually in there. His name's Angel. He's called the Angel of Route 66. He came up with the idea for historic Route 66. But I want to talk about composition for a second. Edward Weston said that composition is the strongest way of seeing. And you know, that's one of the cool things about all you guys listening. You know, you're photographers, you see the world differently than non photographers. So when it comes to composition, look at the smiling, uh, look at his face there. Look at the mirror. I have a picture of him. We can see his nice profile in the mirror. And then I have the, there's a, p a photograph of him, Angel, over there on the right. So when I was taking this picture, I'm looking all around. I'm thinking, what's the strongest composition I could get? Also, you see I'm down a little below eye level. <clears throat> the height at which you hold your camera is very important when you're photographing people. Now, if I had been just standing up, you know, he's a little shorter than I was, it would look like a snapshot. So think about that when you're, when you're photographing. Also, quick, uh, quick tip, uh, dead center is deadly when it comes to composition. He's off center. The reason off center subjects, uh, uh, when the subject's off center in a photograph, the reason it looks more interesting is because your eye runs around the frame to see what else is in the frame. So you know, if the subject's in the center, your eyes get stuck on that. Uh, we're going to be working on this picture first, uh, one of my favorite shots, again, from Tutankhari. I tell people, when, wherever you go, set a goal. Try to tell the whole story. Take the close-ups. Take the wide-angle shots. Take the people shots, as you saw. Take the nighttime shots. Take the wide-angle shots. Do the details. Do all this stuff. Tell the whole story. You know, if you look at this place, this is the Ranch House Cafe Mexican food. My guess is that the Mexican food <laughs> wasn't, wasn't that good. So this is the shot that we're going to work on. You can see how pretty flat looking shot here. The sky was kind of flat, right? But with Topaz Restyle, I'm going to use the street effect there and the gray tail light. It's one of like dozens of, uh, do dozens of uh, options you can choose. And actually, there's probably a million, and I'm not exaggerating as I often do, there's probably a million different variations that you could come up with with Restyle and most of the uh, Topaz plugins because there's so many variations you can create with the uh, sliders. Talk about telling the story. This is also in uh, Tutankhari, a little gas station junkyard here, or the remains of a gas station. Here's a wide angle shot, but if you look at the truck there, if you look at the sign, uh, on the side of the truck and the, the gas pump over there, I zoomed in. Actually, I moved in and I zoomed in. So I got this shot. So we try to tell the story. We can tell the story simply by moving in and zooming in. And then we have a detail shot, right? This is just taken along the side of the road, off center subject. Didn't have to use uh, denoise there. Uh, again, most noise shows up in the shadow areas, off center subject. And then my last tip before we get to the, uh, the, the demonstrations is to have fun. Take, take the, we had this awesome car. <laughs> we had this toxic orange uh, Dodge Challenger that were cruising around on Route 66. That, that, made the trip, uh, that made the trip like a ton of fun. So we, we took uh, some of the fun uh, behind the scene shots. So if you have any questions about travel photography, again, check out the, the grid. I answer a lot of questions there, but you could also contact me at Rick Salmon, uh, Rick Salmon at me.com, but you could also check out my website. All right, let's go to New Topaz. Call it New Topaz because I, I, I mean, <laughs> I was playing with all these plugins. I was having so much fun. I kept going new, 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 whatever. Okay, so we're going to, now, I know a lot of you guys use uh, Lightroom. So in Lightroom, you could you could export your pictures, you know, into Topaz. I use Photoshop more than Lightroom, although on my workshops, uh, I teach uh, both. But the day someone shows me something in Lightroom that you can't do in Photoshop, that's when I'm going to switch to Lightroom. Uh, Lightroom totally. So here's my image. <laughs> you can see, you may not be able to tell right away, but this image is uh, cropped. I talked about that Border Patrol. As I said, I run my eye around the frame to see what I want in the frame. 
and what I don't want in the frame. Well, look at this. There's a tiny little piece of building over here that's bothering me. So this border patrol, as small as that sounds, uh, it, that's really important. Also, cropping. Cropping is very important. When I send books, when I send my pictures to a book publisher, I write this. Crop my pictures and you're a dead man with a little happy face after it. <laughs> Meaning that I, you know, you spend so much time composing your pictures, spend time cropping your pictures. Why would you want anyone else to, you know, crop something important out of your picture like this telephone pole? Well, look how silly this would look if this window was like, uh, was like half cropped, right? So we don't want to do that. So cropping is important. Uh, composition is important. And cropping, when you think about it, cropping gives us a second chance at composition. Um, actually, I was given a seminar, a <laughs> live seminar. I'm talking about uh, uh, composition and uh, cropping. I came up with a new term, cropposition. <laughs> so cropposition, I think, is important. OK, Nicole, here we go. <laughs> so we're going to go to uh, Restyle. Restyle is is one of the, I just want to make sure I click the right one, is one of the, the newer plugins. I really like this because it lets you restyle your picture, like I said, in all these, all these different ways. Now this looks pretty similar to the version that I showed you before in my slideshow is because it's one of my favorites. I've marked it as my favorite, but also it's the last one I use. So it comes up if that's the last one you use. That's why it's going to come up. So if you're doing like a series of pictures of Route 66, you might want to just you know keep using this. But I find that each picture is so different, maybe with highlights like the clouds, shadows. You want to probably work on each picture individually. Here you see the original up here on the right, and here you see the version. Now, so how do you get these ideas? So I'm going to do reset. See, that's a big difference already. So as I said, we're using street. Now I could scroll through all of these and see the different ones, but here's a really quick way. I really like this. They, whoops, let me go back, uh, close this, because I might have done that too fast. I'm from New York. I do things fast. And by the way, I'm not getting into really depth uh, on, on all of these. Topaz has so many uh, great webinars and uh, and other, they work with a ton of other pros, like my friend Hal Schmidt, who has the best, I think, one of the best uh, trainings on the Topaz de Noise. I'm going to go through some of the artistic uh, elements that I use. So I'm on street. I'm going to click on this icon here. It looks like a tic-tac-toe board. And I'm going to go down. So what I do is I go down. So I'm going to go down till I find this gray one with the taillights. Where is that? And if I can't find it quickly, I could just uh, click... Uh, Click my favorite. Should be coming here. Keep going down. There it is. Okay, so I have marked this as my favorite. So this is what you do. When you find something you like, you can mark it as your favorite. So here's what's cool about well, there's a million things that are cool about it. Here's what I like about it. You have control over all these different tones in your picture, which are over here, but you see you have your primary, your secondary, your third, your fourth, your fifth tone. Now, to show you how cool this is, and to show you why it's so important to see tones in a picture. You know, sometimes we get enamored with the color, with the subject, and whatever, and we don't make the right exposure decisions. My number one exposure tip is in camera, you want to expose for the highlights. You don't want the brightest part of the scene overexposed and washed out. Even, no matter how skilled you are, at Photoshop or Lightroom, if those highlights are washed out more than a stop, it's going to be pretty hard for you to get those back. You know, you could do it like say this was overexposed. You could clone from here, reduce the opacity, but it, it, it might work, but it, it also might look fake. But watch this. I'm not going to change the U here. I'm not going to change the saturation for now, but I am going to click on luminance here. So watch what happens when I change this color. The sky's changing, but not much of the rest, and the clouds are changing, but not, not too much of the other part of the scene is changing. Over here, look how the foreground and the truck, I'm getting more detail there. Over here, look, at this is really just affecting the ground, and I want to I bring that out because, you know, when you're driving around out west there, you have this, these red rocks, so I wanted to bring that out. 
And look, if I go over here, I could make the sky like really bold. Here I can make it lighter. I think this might, I think I'm going to make it even bolder than I made it before. And here I'm adjusting the clouds. Now if you do it too much, see it looks kind of weird. So I just want to bring out a little more detail in the clouds. Now, <clears throat> in Photoshop, when you apply a filter and go to edit, fade, filter, you could fade the filter to see the effect there. Or if you have another layer, you could reduce the, uh, you could reduce the uh, opacity of the top layer. Look at this. We can, if we don't know, if we don't think, we're, if we want to see the original, all we have to do is, if we don't like it, we could dial in. So this is what I'm talking about, that there's like a million different variations. And one of the reasons why I like doing this is because I teach workshops, and we all basically photograph the same thing. So how do you make your pictures stand out? You know, from a shot like this, you know, that everyone's going to take, you know, to a to a cooler shot, uh, to a cooler shot like that. So, uh, and actually, I'm I'm going to leave that like that for now. So that opacity slider, that that opacity slider, I think is uh, is uh, pretty good. Actually, I'm going to go back to this, change my mind. So we could go. Back, if we want to warm it up, we could warm up our picture just a little. We tend to like pictures on the warm side. Okay, so we have a loop here. If we want to check out out the uh, you know the detail here, which is cool. But the histogram is really important. What the histogram does is the histogram shows us basically the distribution of the different light levels in the scene. Basically, if you imagine each brightness level as a brick, right? A lot of midtones. So we have a lot of midtones here. So this st stack of bricks is really high. Not too many highlights over here. That's why this is low. We have some shadows. That's why this is over here. The key is you don't want like a spike over here and you don't want a spike over here. This is where your tone comes in. If I want to maximize this image. Most of the information in any picture, in camera, Photoshop, Lightroom, whatever, when you see a histogram, it's over here on the right. So I'm going to move this over to the right as much as possible without getting a spike. If I get a spike, here's what happens. Remember I said if, uh, if you don't expose for the highlights, you're, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to bring them back if they're more than a stop overexposed. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to just make sure that's over there to make sure the highlights aren't overexposed and washed out. Sometimes I like to boost uh, the blacks back this way, okay, because yes, <clears throat> especially with HDR, we can see into the shadows as I mentioned and open up the highlights, but our pictures look flat. So shadows add a sense of depth and dimension. And so does a uh, contrast add a sense of depth and dimension. So let me just go down here. We go down to structure. Look what happens. Look how look how cool this texture looks now in the dirt here. And I might sharpen this up just a little bit. And once again, I'm going to go back to this opacity. And I could, if I want to dial that down, I can do this. So this is one of all these different, all these different uh, options that you have in Topaz uh, Restyle. And if we go back to comparing. You know, you can see this looks pretty flat. So I'm going to click OK, just so you can see it, just so you can see a larger version of it. You know, you can see in just about, well, it took a little longer than if I did it myself, probably only about five or six minutes, I was able to create a pretty dramatic picture from a very flat picture. So when you're out shooting, it's really important to envision the end result. Always envision the end result. Ansel Adams did that. And you know, most of the master black and white photographers did that. So if it worked for them, <laughs> my friends, it could work for you. Here's a picture. Well, actually, let me show you this first. It's a, a pretty boring scene, a golf course, uh, not too far from uh, where I live. So I said, OK, what can I do? So I took my little uh, Canon camera, point to shoot camera, converted to infrared only there. But this is a little. Uh, Oh, there's a little jumpy thing down there. I don't know what that was. So it's a point and shoot camera. <clears throat> Look at this noise. To just too much noise. When you see it small, you know, might, you might not notice it. So I want to get rid of that noise. So I'm going to go to filter. I'm going to go to uh, topaz. I'm going to go to topaz uh, denoise 5. By the way, 
if you haven't upgraded to all these uh, latest uh, versions, Topaz is always updating, updating what they're doing. Let me go to fit. Updating what they're doing with uh, like new screens to make it easier to navigate or whatever. So make sure you log into the Topaz website and and Nicole can give you some more information on that because you really should be uh, uh, keep updated. So here's the thing. What you want to do, what I found, is that, let me go here, look at this. <clears throat> what you want to do is I could take out the, strong, I, the strongest uh, amount of noise. But what happens when you do that, then you start to get blurry parts of the picture. Everything in photography, you see, this has taken a while down there, and this is actually a relatively small file. So the bigger the file, the longer this is, uh, this is going to take. But we have no noise here, right? We have the detail in the cloud, but we have some blurry areas around here. So what I do is I always start with the most moderate one. So uh, moderate seem to work for this one. Sometimes I have to use strong. Sometimes I think I have to use the strongest. By the way, debanding. Debanding is a good feature, which I can't show you right now because it's a whole other thing. But if you're shooting in low light, and your picture's way underexposed, you could actually see the bands of pixels, the vertical and the horizontal bands of pixels in your file. So this debanding, if you've seen that, um, this is a great way to get rid of it. But everything in photography is a trade-off. So we've got rid of the noise here, but it's a little soft around here. So then I go down here. Again, there's a lot of other things you can do. But right now, I'm just going to give you the basics, like I'm doing in all of these. You recover the detail. Now, if you move the slider all the way over here, you're going to get your noise back. So you want to move it till you start to see a little noise and then start to move it back just a little bit. And reducing blur, the same thing. Move it over until you see some blurred edges and move it back. But if you want a detailed, a really detailed explanation of denoise, as I mentioned, check out that... Uh, uh, the webinar that my friend Hal Schmidt did with uh, with uh, my friend Nicole here. Okay, we're back on Route 66. We're at the Wigwam Motel. My friend Stephen Gleamer from Canon uh, told me that these are actually your wigwams. <laughs> but here's another example of that technique I was uh, talking about, the see-through it, shoot-through it. It's really a fun thing to do. You can practice in your driveway. Having a cool subjects like this, uh, this does help. But I use the Border Patrol here. I frame the car on the left. So it's in that window. I frame the, uh, the TP or the wigwams over there on the right. I know I've said it a few times, but it's so important. You have to expose for the highlights. If the highlights uh, are overexposed and washed out, like over here, and not, you can see the, 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 uh, the lines in this TP. If they're overexposed, you've missed the shot. So let's go here to... Another one of my favorites, black and white effects. This is really cool. When we take the reality out of the scene, we take out, uh, when we take the color out of the scene, we take out some of the reality. And when we take out some of the reality, our pictures can, but not always, look a little more creative, a little more artistic. Now, when it comes to black and white, what happens is, we don't have colors to rely on to uh, you know, draw us into the picture. So what do we have to rely on? Well, the subject, of course. Never underestimate the importance of a good subject. But contrast. Contrast is very important. And here, you can see we don't have a lot of contrast. If you want to get good at making black and white images, the key is to use black and white filters and to understand what these filters do. So here's no filter. You know, when I was I first land, learned on uh, taking black and white pictures on my father's four by five inch uh, Linhop camera, and he had all these uh, different filters. So here's no filter, right? Look what the red filter does. Ansel Adams used a red filter to to add some contrast to the scene, to add some drama to the scene. Look what the orange filter does. It makes the sky even blacker. Blacker. It makes it stand out a little more. Yellow, not so much. Green, kind of boring to me compared to the red. And blue, look, look at the difference between blue and red and red and orange. 
So the blue gives you a totally different feel. So when it comes down to it, you know, we have all these plugins. We've been talking technical and all this other stuff. But when it comes down to it, the most important thing, the most important thing when it comes to an image is it's the mood. It's the feeling. It's the emotion that someone gets. So here, right? Okay, there's no filter. Kind of boring. But here, you know, someone says, wow, look at that dramatic sky. So let's go down here. By the way, you have all these, these controls here. And if you don't know what a control does, all you have to do is hover your your well I'm using the stylus <laughs> you could uh, move your trackpad control over that or your mouse but I'm using the Wacom uh, uh, stylus here so we can increase the contrast right make it even more dramatic we could decrease the contrast we could do the brightness look how flat that looks again what's important to black and white contrast this is your adaptive exposure here and this is your burn and uh, dodge tool so say I don't have to do it but say I wanted to burn over here. If this TP was a little too, uh, or wigwam was a little too bright, I would, uh, I would do that. But I'm going to go here to my adaptive exposure, and this is kind of like, you know, HDR. Like, look at this. This is amazing that I can maintain detail in the shadow areas and the highlight areas. If I want to boost the whites, I could boost the whites. But then look what happens, right? That's overexposed and washed out. So this is an and if I move it back here, you can see we even have more detail. So this adaptive exposure. Oh, I was up on the basic exposure. Sorry. This adaptive exposure, as I was saying, is like HDR. Look at all the detail we can see in the in the in the in the on the floorboards and on the door panel of this old car. This is really a cool place, by the way. So protecting the highlights. If I dial this back, right? I blow out the highlights if I move it here. You know, the reason I talk about this so much, protecting the shadows, right? If I want to open up the shadows. The reason I talk about the highlights and the shadows so much is this. When you think about it, every picture you've ever taken, every picture you will take has one main element, and that's light, right? If you break that one main element down, every picture you've ever taken, every picture you will take has two sub-elements highlights and shadows. So if when we're out there, if we learn how to see the difference between the highlights and the shadows, we know when we need HDR, we know when the highlights are going to be overexposed and washed out, and we know what we could do in the digital darkroom with plugins. So boosting these details, now look what we look at all the details we have down here. And when I go back to the original, you see that even in the original file I didn't have that. So basically, we can create kind of like an HDR picture from a straight file with all these powerful controls. There are some creative effects here. I don't think I'm going to use any of those right now. Local adjustments. Again, we could burn and dodge, as I was talking about right there. We could smooth, but because I got a good camera, a good in camera exposure, I don't have to do that. But check this out. I love this. Now look at this image. This looks, to me, way cooler than the color shot, the silver and paper tone. Again, this is in the Platinum Collection. It's one of all these different collections that we have that we can use, uh, that we can use uh, over there. And I wasn't exaggerating, my friends, as you can see, that you have a million different options because just by moving this slider, this, you know, we do live in the slider generation. And I've embraced the slider generation, and you know I'm kind of I'm kind of loving it. So I'm almost done with uh, this picture here. I'm just going to go down to. Uh, is there anything else I want to do here? Uh, edge exposure. I could control that, and that transparency feature. We could do vignetting. This is what I was telling you about before. We could bring back, you know, some of the original uh, image. So here's what the topaz effect. You know. Uh, you know, applied completely, but look at this where we add a hint of color. So I'm going to click OK, and you be the judge. You know, now if you're working for National Geographic, they're going to want they're going to want a shot like this. They're going to want true color. But if you want to have some fun, if you want to create a dramatic image, this is what I was talking about, by the way, down there with all that detail. 
I think that this looks uh, a lot more creative than the, than the other one. But it's all subjective. All art is subjective, you know. The famous painter Kincaid, he loved those bold colors and uh, you know super uh, super saturated images. But a lot of people, uh, you know, di didn't like his uh, work. Uh, I'm gonna we're coming down the home stretch here, getting back to cropping. I took this picture on my Death Valley workshop, where I'm going next year again. If you want to join the fun, uh, just shoot me an email. There's an old car at uh, one of the mines out there. <clears throat> Here's the thing. I think that the subject often suggests, the subject suggests the plugin that you want to use. So if you're doing like uh, the, uh, a black and white, right? You want a true black, you might want a true uh, black white image or you want, might want to do a special effect like I showed you, but it's all subjective. Here we have this really cool car so I thought I'd use the first plugin that I ever uh, used from Topaz, which is uh, Topaz Adjust. It's in a different place now. They have this vibrant collection. But I'm going to go to that, what I was kidding Nicole about, the Spicify or Spicify filter. Look at this. So here's the after, and here's the before. Again, that subject, I think, suggests the end result. So the more you use these plugins, uh, and the more, the more you play around with the sliders, the more familiar you'll become. So when you're out there shooting, uh, I don't know if my friend Andy Smith is uh, listening, and my friend Joe Rotruck, they, uh, they were out there, and I know they're big on plugins. Andy, if you're there, let Nicole know or shoot me an email. Uh, they, love, they love the Topaz plugins too. But you know, when you're out there shooting, you can look at a scene like this and say, oh, oh man, the, the light's you know, kind of flat, you know, so what? I'm going to spice this up uh, with with a plugin. So we have global adjustments here. We have the finishing touches, uh, basically this, the same adjustments that we have before. But we could add a nice border to this. We can control the size. We can control the size of the border. And if you're doing a slideshow, you can pick the color from the image, or you could select the color. Uh, I think I'll just go with uh, let's go with white. Click OK. If you're, you see now the picture stands out against this gray. If you're giving a slideshow or for a, on your website, you have a black background. This white border will help the picture to stand out in the background. If you have a, if you have a white, a web, a white background on your website, pick a black border. Another thing is so many things we have to remember as photographers. We see the world in three dimensions: height, width, and depth. Uh, our cameras only see two. So whenever possible, we want to try to create a sense of depth and dimension in our pictures. We can do that by shooting at an angle. If I just shot straight on, the picture would look very, very flat. Also, this is a daylight fill and flash shot. When I was out there, actually I had my friend Andy Smith explain daylight fill and flash because he's been on so many workshops, he's actually mastered this. Um, it's a daylight fill and flash shot. You could do a search, Rick Salmon. A daylight fill in flash, and you'll see I, I've written about uh, 10 articles on that. So, too, too complicated. It's not too complicated, actually, it's very easy, but it's just too long to get into here. So, here's the before shot, here's the after shot. Okay, we're going to keep going here. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, let me see, I could do this black and white one. Let me, let me try this one. We, we may go back to, uh, to black and white. Uh, okay, so what do I want to do here? I think I want to go to Topaz uh, Simplify 4 here. So what are we, what are we doing here? Oh, I just downloaded the new version. That's why that looked like that. <laughs> I took my own advice, see? <laughs> uh, this BuzzZim, this is cool. I like, uh, I'm going to just use the default one for now. What have we done? We've taken out the details. By taking out the details, we've done what I said before. We've removed some of the reality. And when we move some of the reality, our pictures can, but not always, look a little more artistic, a little more creative. I mean, this looks pretty much like a painting. So yes, there are iPhone and iPad apps that, uh, that let you do this, but not with the, all the different control controls that you have here. 
So we have that. Uh, let me go to the finishing touches down here. Was, you don't always have to start at the top. You have that transparency fill, uh, feature that I was telling you about before, where you could reduce it. We don't have to go. Well, I'll just show you because I think it's. I, I do this a lot. I play around with the transparency filter a lot to fine tune the image. You might think, oh, it looks too much like a painting. I want to see a little more detail. And here, once again, you know, I went through a lot of these things with a lot with these pictures on a lot of different plugins. But once again, I think that the subject really does suggest the end result, but it may suggest a, a different end result to you than it does uh, than it does to me. Uh, Nicole, we're doing good on time. Yeah, we're doing good. We have a lot of questions, so whenever you're ready to start okay. answering those, it's good. Okay, <laughs> let me cancel this. Uh, so anyway, I love that one too. Uh, well, I'll leave you with these two. <laughs> I was in Myanmar, and these are two of my favorite pictures from Myanmar. So we started with travel tips, and we'll end with travel tips. Yes, we could do, as you saw, and I was talking really fast. That's why you could watch the. <laughs> I wanted to get so much in in the in the in the short time that we have. Uh, you could watch the YouTube uh, uh, video of this. But there's so much we can do with the plugins. There are a million different things we can do. I really believe that plugins can help you awaken the artist within. And I did say, I think twice, that the subject often suggests, you know, the, the plugin and the end result. Well, sometimes you don't need a plugin or you don't want to use a plugin. Sometimes you want to go for the straight shot. Now here's two examples. This is a woman, a long neck woman, they come from Thailand, uh, and they're in, in Myanmar, and it's actually an optical illusion that their necks look like they're stretched. These are 25 pounds. Uh, it's so heavy, it pushes their shoulders down. So whenever I go somewhere, I take what's called the head shot or the head and shoulder shot, and I take the environmental portrait. So by taking the environmental portrait and by taking the head shot, again, I'm, I'm telling the story. Both of these pictures, by the way, have nice side light. Like It's not really Rembrandt lighting. Rembrandt lighting has a true a uh, triangle underneath the shadow under the eye and the shadow side of the subject's face. But yeah, you could you could have all these fun all this fun with plugins. But if you use that was just my whack my tablet I hit the wrong button. Um, if you, if you use you for like all your pictures, you know you could develop a style. But also you know someone might look at it and say oh you know they should they should mix it up. So I guess the end of the story is when it comes to plugins when it comes to photography just like with music. I play music. Actually, if you go on my bio page, I just uploaded a, a new video of me playing bass guitar. Um, follow your heart. Following your heart is just so very, very important. So, Nicole, when I'm answering the questions, um, do people still see my screen? Yes, they do. Okay. Because maybe then I could jump in and answer or something like that. This sure. is taken in Death Valley, too, by the way. Illustrates exposing for the highlights, the brightest part of the subjects face. All right, awesome. Are you, you ready to answer some of these questions coming through? Sure. All right. Well, first off, we've had some awesome feedback about all of your images, so thank you so much for sharing all of that information. Well, well, thank you. Do you know the difference? One of the differences, Nicole, between a professional photographer and an amateur is professional photographer doesn't have to show his bad pictures. So, <laughs> so, so I'm like, you know, I'm only showing you my best pictures like everyone else on the planet, you know. I go on Route 66, I'm, I might take 400 pictures, you know, I, sh I show eight. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I didn't yeah. think about it like that. <laughs> um, well, we did have a ton of questions about your Route 66 pictures, so I'll start there since you started there as well. Um, let's see here. Richard started off the questions and said, what state or states along Route 66 um, do you enjoy visiting the most? Can I can I open my Firefox or that's going to slow us down? Um, yeah, you you can. Um, if it slows us down too much, I'll I'll let you know. Okay. Oh, you have like. Uh, okay. I can tell if it starts lagging. Yeah. Uh, if we go over here to photo galleries. See, I like taking reality out of the scene. On Route 66, uh, where are my Route 66 galleries? What we did is we flew to Albuquerque, New Mexico where we photographed uh, this diner, the Route 66 diner. And then from there we drove to uh, 
to uh, Texas, and then we came back. But Tutankari, where this picture was taken, was New Mexico. This is New Mexico. This was Williams. Uh, this is Tutankari, Tutankari. I would say Tutankari. This place, this is only about an hour outside of Vegas. It's called Chloride. It's very, very cool. So what we did is we flew to Albuquerque, uh, shot there, drove east to Texas, then drove back and wound up through uh, at, at Las Vegas. Okay, great. Also, we have some questions um, from people, um, including, let's see here, Edward, who was asking, are the old cars always on display along the route, or was there a scheduled car show that you attended? No, this car down here, well, I actually, you know, there's a big difference between taking a picture and, uh, and making a picture. So I asked the man who had this car, it was parked over here, I asked him to move it into position. But yeah, all the cars that uh, that we saw, that's like the at the Wigwam Motel, these cars are parked there. This truck is parked there. These taillights, uh, it's my wife, uh, we do this wherever we go. At night she's driving through the scene to add uh, some uh, interest. This car was there in the Hackberry. The truck was there in Tutankari. So yeah, uh, all this stuff is there. That's why this is like a photographer's uh, a photographer's uh, dream trip. It was so much fun. Very cool. It looks like it was. Um, with this type of trip or any of your travel photography, um, we had several people, including uh, Mel, ask how often and under what circumstances do you use a tripod? And then Dave clarified or asked for some clarification or recommendations on any tripods for traveling mm -hmm. that you might have. Yeah. Well, I have a bunch of different tripods. I have a really right stuff tripod. The, the, actually, the, the more important question is about the ball head. You, know, you want a good ball head. Uh, but when it comes to tripods, a lot of people come on my workshops uh, with cheap tripods, and they leave getting, wanting to get, excuse me, want to get better tripods. You need a good sturdy tripod if you're going to do you know, wildlife photography, like up in Alaska, if you're going to be, you know, photographing with a ball head, you know, these bald eagles, although some are handheld, for distant subjects like these whales here, uh, bubble net feeding, you want, you know, a sturdy tripod. But you don't need, you know, the heaviest, sturdiest tripod in the world if you're going to, you know, go out west, the wide angle lens, you know, and, and photograph, photograph a scene like this, which illustrates, by the way, <laughs> exposing for the highlights. Uh, if you didn't, I'd get, if I didn't, I'd get some blur there. So, you know, invest, get the best tripod that you could uh, afford, for sure. Do you find that you use tripods majority of the time? Well, I'm doing a lot, I'm doing a lot now, uh, handheld the HDRs at nighttime and for blurring water, like if I go back to Alaska. I couldn't take uh, couldn't take this shot without a tripod. Mm -hmm. Couldn't take this this one of my favorite uh, waterfall shots. And by the way, uh, that's the home. If you guys want to follow me on uh, on Google Plus, you'll see that that's uh, you know join 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 some other people who who have been uh, following me. But um, this picture could not have been taken. Uh, could not have been taken without a tripod. Same thing with this painting with light picture that I think I showed on my. What? Not, how many times have I been on the call? Six. I think. <laughs> yes, my, and this is on your last one. I think that was on my. That's a painting with light tripod. Check this out. I mean, I have this beautiful bass guitar. Uh, <laughs> look, look at these. I know I'm digressing for a second, but look, <laughs> look, look at these kids I was playing with last night. They're playing with the old guy. I mean, <laughs> how much fun is this? You gotta have fun. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, let's see here. We have um, let's see here. more technical questions coming through as well. If you could give us sure. some answers to those or real quick uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, Calvin had said his camera creates HDR in camera and combines the exposures and gives him one picture. Is there a drawback to using this rather than manually creating an HDR? Well, what that does is, you know, I have the Canon 5D Mark III, and my camera does that. And what that does is that process that gives you, with my camera, it lets you process your, uh, it processes the three raw files into a JPEG. On some cameras, 
it just gives you the JPEG. It doesn't give you the, the raw files. But <clears throat> that's like one, that's like a default processing. So in other words, you don't have control over the highlights. You don't have control over the shadows. You don't have the like all the different controls like that I've been showing you here today. Remember the white point and the black point sliders? Um, so the, the, the advantage is you can see if those three exposures are going to be enough to, to uh, create an HDR image. Sometimes you need four, five, seven, nine. And plus the starting point isn't always at zero. So there's no drawback to doing that. And actually, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to, to do that. But you're going to have way more control when you process those, those three images uh, you know, in an HDR program. Cool, thanks. Uh, Mike said, do you use manual or autofocus since you go for a one-third focal point? Well, I, I go for that when I want everything in the scene in focus. So that was a wide-angle lens, small aperture, focusing mm -hmm. one-third into the scene. Uh, and, but I'm sorry, did you use manual or auto for those types of... Oh, for, for that, I'm mm -hmm. still using auto. I'll either place the, the dot on, the, you know, the, the square in the viewfinder on that, or I'll, repos I'll set the focus and reposition and, mm -hmm. and shoot. The only time I'm really using manual focus would be for those low-light shots that I was uh, talking about, because cameras use contrast to, uh, to focus. And, uh, you know, some of these cameras have, you know, they project a beam in the dark and the flashes do that, speed lights do that, to, um, so the camera can focus on the, on the contrast. But I'm a big believer in, uh, in autofocus. This picture was taken that you're looking at on uh, autofocus. And uh, I'm also a big believer on shooting uh, aperture priority. Every picture you, I showed today was taken mm -hmm. on the uh, aperture priority mode, except, as my friend... <laughs> Andy Smith knows if he's listening. It was my daylight fill and flare shots. The, the picture of the girl by the car. That was uh, that was taken. Uh, I use a manual when I'm shooting uh, speed lights. So do the search, Rick Salmon, daylight fill and flare. You'll come up with a ton of articles. Oh, thank you for that. All right, we have a couple more questions here. Um, it was Richard and Daniel uh, had asked about the infrared shot that you showed. Uh, they wanted to know um, if you, or Richard wanted to know if you were using an infrared camera, and if you were, Daniel wanted to know what Canon point and shoot did you use for that shot? Yeah, this shot is about five years old. It was uh, converted, it was a Canon, one of the Canon uh, power shots. Uh, I'd have to get up, take my headset off to get it, but it was like it's like a, I could get it. it's like a two hundred dollar uh, camera. It wasn't you know which has you know more noise than you know a Canon digital SLR. Uh, so it was about a two hundred dollar camera, but it was converted by, uh, to infrared by LifePixel, LifePixel.com, mm -hmm. and uh, they do a great job. But there are a bunch of different conversions that you can get, and once your camera is converted, that's it. So when you're choosing, and they have examples on the website, make sure you're choosing, choosing the one uh, that, that you think you're going to like. And then processing the images is nice. You know, this, is, this shows the sky blue. You could get a conversion with a, and processing the, and use a process, processing technique where the sky is going to be, sky is going to be, be black. Great, thank you. Sure. You you know you're so polite. Your mother would be proud of you. You always say thank <laughs> you. Always say thank you. Not everyone does that. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I'm gonna go ahead and end with Kim's question, and she um, was asking, "What are your favorite Topaz plugins or your go-to plugins?" Well, I think you saw that I really do like the like. Look at this. I really do like uh, the black and white. Black and white really it lets us take that reality out of the scene. I'm just uh, playing around with the different border here. There's so many different borders uh, that we could choose uh, from. And again, I think the border also, uh, the border also, the subject suggests the border that uh, that we want to use. So I like uh, Restyle. I started with Restyle. You saw what it did on my uh, Route 66 picture of the bad Mexican <laughs> restaurant that went out of business. Uh, black and white is great. The noise saves, uh, 
it can save the day. So if I go back to here, let me just uh, cancel cancel out of that, but you saw how good that looked. If I go back to my uh, my little slideshow here, and thank you for having me, Nicole. This is always uh, this is always fun. If I go through my list here, um, in focus is 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 a lot of fun. Restyle is fun. Simplify star effects. I don't really use too much, but it does give you that uh, that starburst effect on small points of light. So I would have to say, my my favorite one right now it might be a tie between black and white and uh, and restyle. But uh, I don't know. Clarity is kind of good. They're all good. And if you buy the bundle, you save a bundle. Yes, you definitely do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rick. We really, really appreciate you coming back and sharing your travel photography tips and your Topaz tips and appreciate all the information. Well, listen, I'm going to go for if it's been I'm going to go for like at least a dozen a dozen Topaz <laughs> webinars before, before before I'm going to be 64 this year. <laughs> so, so maybe I could get one more in before I'm 64. We'll see. <laughs> awesome. Well we'll, well, we'll hold you to it. Thank you again, Rick. Really appreciate it. Everybody's given some awesome feedback. So. <laughs> well, thank you. You make it fun. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day, evening, morning, wherever you are. And we'll be talking to you hopefully on Thursday. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.